Revelation 21, verse 1 says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with men. He will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. Verse 8, But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Verse 27, the last verse. But nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Now, this makes me feel really old. <laughs> I'm going to tell you about something that happened 38 years ago that I remember. Because when I was a kindergartner or in first grade, if you would have asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up, I would have told you I wanted to be an astronaut. An astronaut. Until... 1986, when I was six years old, as a space shuttle Challenger was lost, uh, launched, and just shortly after a minute into its flight, there was a catastrophic failure that led to an explosion and the death of the seven people that were aboard. What happened? What happened? Well, after all of the studies and investigation, what they found that there was actually just a very little O-ring that failed. And it led to a chain of events and ultimately catastrophic failure and the death of seven people. Well, that was the end of my desire to be an astronaut. But what I was thinking about was this. It was just one small thing that led to great destruction and ruin. Maybe when we think about sin, we think it is something that is very small or insignificant, something that is of very little importance. But I want you to think back in the history of mankind, thinking about the truth of Genesis chapter 3. We read those words, whereas by one man... Sin entered into the world. It tells us by one man and one sin entered into the world. Now, what was the sin of the first man, Adam? Was it murder? Was it idolatry? Well, the Bible tells us very simply it was an act of disobedience. God had given him a command that he should not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The tree wasn't poisonous. The tree wasn't bad. It was actually very beautiful, and the fruit was good. But the act of disobeying God, that was sin against God. And the Bible tells us that is how sin entered into the world. Now, just a little bit of context. You read, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis tells us you can read the account in how when God had finished his, his work, he declared it was very good. 
everything that God had made was to his perfect satisfaction. God himself, in all of his wisdom and power, he said, this is very good. And he put Adam into a garden that was very good. And he brought a wife to him, and that was very good. But then sin enters into the world through Adam's disobedience. What was the result of that one act? That one sin, that one disobedience, we might say just a small insignificant disobedience to God. Well, we could say it was catastrophic failure because the entire human race would be affected by the sin of Adam. The very same chapter that we read of Adam's disobedience against God, for the very first time you will read of sorrow. You will read of fear of God in hiding from God. You will read of conflict between Adam and Eve. You will read of not the blessings of God that they had once known, but God pronounces curse or punishment because of that disobedience. And instead of simply enjoying all of the good that God had purpose for Adam, God says, now you are going to work the soil, and in what it is going to produce is not going to be what is good, but thorns and thistles. And you are going with the sweat of your brow to work until the day you die. What a great contrast when God said that everything was good because of one sin coming into the world, we are going to see in a very short time that the earth is completely filled with violence. One sin turns into millions of sins. One sin against God turns into trillions or quadrillions of sins against God. And what was once good is no longer good. There is going to be fighting. There is going to be bitterness. There is going to be murder and deceit. That was not God's purpose in the beginning. But one failure, one sin, and what was once perfect is ruined. As it were, paradise was lost to Adam and Eve because of one sin. And you look at the world that we live in today and all of the evil that exists, we read of so much violence, of lying and deceit and immorality and idolatry, a world that is so turned upside down, so ruined by sin, by one sin at the beginning. But it contaminated, it corrupted, it defiled as it were, Every aspect of our world, it affects our minds, the way that we think. It affects our desires, the things that we want. It affects the things that we do with our hands, the things that we do with our feet. To do so many things that are not pleasing, that are an offense to God. So from one act of sin, plunging the entire human race into ruin, the terms that Romans chapter 3 says is this, is that we are all ruined. It's like the banana that you leave on the counter for a week. It turns black, and it turns to mush, and it spoils. It's useless. It is not what God intended for us, but it is what sin has done in us, what sin has done in this world, in God's perfect world. Sin has ruined it, and it has ruined us. So that is why we read in the book of Revelation that ultimately God is going to have to do away with this earth, that there is going to be a new heavens and a new earth. Now, we're not going to enter in all the details of future events, but just to keep this very simple, sin has affected this world and even though the Lord Jesus in his thousand-year kingdom is going to rejuvenate and transform, ultimately God is going to have to do away with this world. 
Now, I was thinking about this and what we heard last night from Dan. What really is important? Is it having things in this world? Fame or money or power? The Bible tells us the day is coming. It's all going to perish. It's going to pass away. It will be no more. So we would be very foolish if everything we had we invested into this life and this world because it is going to come to an end. What the Bible tells us is this, is that heaven and earth are going to pass away, but there is going to be a new heaven and a new earth that God is going to make. Verse 1 tells us, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away. Why? Because of one sin that multiplied into a multitude of sin, and sin that defiles, that ruins, that corrupts us, God is going to do away with it. The sea is going to be no more. You notice it says, I saw uh, the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming out of heaven from God. What is going to characterize the new earth and the new heavens is holiness. And what I appreciate about reading this chapter, for those of us that have come to know the Lord Jesus as our Savior, we have an awesome future before us. We have a hope of the holy city of God. What is going to characterize this place is this. It is holiness. What we read is this. A holy city coming down out of heaven from God. It says... Behold, the dwelling place of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. Verse 4 tells us that he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. What causes sorrow? What causes heartache? What causes suffering in the human race? It is sin. But sin is something that is going to be done away with, something that is going to be removed from this holy place. That God is going to wipe away every tear from their eyes, anything that causes grief or sorrow. And death shall be no more. Death is a result of sin, of Adam's sin, of our sin. And if sin is done away with, if sin has been put away, then there will be no more death. Notice what it says. Either shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain. All of those things that we read of that come because of sin will be no more. It says the former things have passed away. I think, I truly believe that the longer that we live, the more we appreciate the future we have as Christians. Because this world becomes less and less attractive. When we see all of the heartache and the ruin and the suffering, likely every one of us has experienced hardship in our lives. The pain of losing a loved one to cancer and death, it grieves our hearts. But you know there is a day, for lack of a better word, that is coming that all of that is going to be removed. All of that is going to be forgotten. But I want you to understand something. That does not mean that everyone that is here is going to be there. Read again with me verse 8. This awesome place of the dwelling of God, where there is absolutely no sorrow, no sickness, no suffering, no death. But verse 8 says this, but... As for the cowardly and the faithless, people that are not willing to trust God or to believe God, those that do evil works, those that murder and take innocent life, people that do not follow God's plan of morality, those who are sorcerers, who are idolaters, in all liars, it says their portion will be the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. What an awesome contrast. There could be no greater contrast if we read of a place that there is no tears, no suffering, no death. 
The Bible speaks of a place called the second death. A place where the weeping and the tears will never cease. A place where the sorrow and suffering will never end. Why is this? Because our sin which is against God, that which separates us from God in our lives, will separate men and women from God eternally. Yes, there is a holy dwelling place with God. But the Bible also tells us there is a place where there is sorrow, where there is continual suffering. What is going to make the difference between those that enjoy the presence of God eternally and those that know the torment eternally? Well, the beginning of this book begins with these words. It is praise to the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who loves us and loosed us from our sin in his own blood. What can deal with the issue of sin? Something that is not a minute problem in the eyes of God, but is an enormous problem in God's eyes. Something that has brought so much sorrow to us. How can our sin ever be removed or ever be dealt with that we might be with God eternally instead of being eternally banished to the lake of fire? It is only the Lord Jesus Christ in his work on the cross of Calvary. Because what transpired there was this, that he was suffering for sins, but not his own. First Peter tells us that Christ also has once suffered for sin, the one who was just, perfect, pure, innocent, so pleasing to God, and yet he was punished for those of us that have sinned against God. Those of us that have rebelled, those of us that have grieved the heart of God because of our sin, and yet God would pour our sin, uh, the wrath uh, that our sin deserved on his son. That is what happened at the cross of Calvary. You want to have an understanding of how awful sin really is, that it is not a small thing, but it's something that is huge in the eyes of God. You look at the cross of Calvary and see what was required by God that our sins be taken away. 1 John chapter 1 tells that it is only the blood of his Son that can clean us, cleanse us, purify us from our sin. When we are speaking of the holiness of God in God's dwelling place, this is what makes it so awesome. There will be no sin there. But here is a problem. You and I have sinned. You and I have sinned against God, and our sin would not allow us to be there. But the Lord Jesus Christ comes into the world to give his life as a sacrifice for sin, and because of what he has done there, God is offering to you the forgiveness of your sins, the removal of your sins, all that sin that defiles, that contaminates us, that corrupts us. God wants to completely remove it from us. Another verse in the Bible says this, that the one who knew no sin, he never spoke a lie, he never used deceit, the one who knew no sin was made to be sin for us. But what is the end, the purpose of God? That we might be made the righteousness of God in him, that we, that we in all of our sin and the stain of it I think we can understand this. When our kids come in from outside, they're out playing in the dirt because that's what kids love to do, right? Dirty hands, dirty feet, dirty faces, dirty clothes. And what does mom tell them when it's time to come in? Take off your shoes, take off your clothes. Sometimes she even tells me that. When I'm all sweaty and dirty, take off your clothes outside because we don't want that on the inside. That is what is going to make heaven heaven, a place where there is no sin. Nothing that defiles, the last verse we read, nothing unclean will enter. There is not going to be any contamination in that place. 
If one sin could bring the entire world into ruin, Adam's sin, let me tell you, in heaven there is going to be absolutely no sin. The Bible says nothing that is unclean will ever enter into it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Friends, sin is an awful thing. And whether you realize it or not, it's a huge problem. It is a huge barrier between you and God. It is something that will bring the wrath of God against you. It will keep you out of His holy heaven. But God's desire is not that. God's desire is that you would know the forgiveness of your sins, that you would come to the Lord Jesus Christ recognizing that is why He came, that is why He suffered, that is why He bled and died on the cross. It was to remove my sin. We don't have time to read 1 Corinthians, but Corinth was a wicked city where there was all class of idolatry and immorality, a very wicked place. But there were men that came into that city to preach the gospel, the work of the Lord Jesus on the cross. You know what Paul goes on to say? Despite the fact that you were wicked sinners in the eyes of God, you were, now you are washed. You are cleansed. You are sanctified. You are justified by the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Friend, can I tell you, there are going to be multitudes of people in God's holy presence for eternity. People that have known the cleansing, the forgiveness of their sins by the Lord Jesus Christ. So please understand something this evening. The Bible speaks of heaven as a very real place. But the Bible also speaks of a place called the lake of fire where there is eternal suffering. What is going to make the difference for you? Either God's holy heaven or the lake of fire is this, is knowing your sins forgiven. And how can those sins be removed? The Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God that bears away the sin of the world. And when you come in all of your need before God for cleansing, he is the one that can take every single sin away. Can I tell you, for the person that comes to the Lord Jesus Christ for forgiveness, all of their sin is removed. Because not one sin will ever be in God's presence, not one. But the work of the Lord Jesus Christ is enough to remove every sin. Listen to what the Word of God tells us so plainly. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, that is the lake of fire, but have everlasting life, that is the eternal, holy dwelling place of God. The dwelling place of God is with men, men that have been forgiven by the grace of God. My question for you is this, are you going to be there? Don't miss heaven, friend. Don't miss it because of your sin. Come to the Lord Jesus Christ and receive the cleansing that he offers of every single one of your 